Good morning and welcome to Casino Baptist Church. My name is Pastor Stephen Gort and I want to thank you for joining with me today. Today we're going to continue our series looking in the book of Acts and we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 3. So if you'd like to find your Bibles, you might like to turn with me to Acts 3 and we're going to look at verse 1 through to 10 today. Now many of you would have heard the great news during the week that doesn't really affect our church but may affect bigger churches and that is the government has lowered the restrictions as far as COVID-19 goes. It means that if you have a church as long as you keep to one and a half meters and four square meters per person you can have up to 300 people on your property for church. It's great that those restrictions are being lowered. Now our prayer is we would love the restrictions to be lowered even more to do different things like singing, but we're just not there yet. But we thank our, our government for lowering the restrictions and we keep praying for them as they make the tricky decisions as we go ahead. So that's something, that's good news. Also, just to let you know that we are praying in particular at the moment for our HSC students, we have a couple, and for teachers who are involved with that, and especially not just for the students, but for the families. So if you could be praying for them at this time, that'll be great as well. In a week's time, uh, we have on the Saturday, it is the annual General Assembly for the Baptist Association. And if you're in Sydney, you might be able to go along physically there or uh, go to one of the other places around our state where you can see it done online. For us up here in the Northern Rivers, that means it's going to be held out at Grafton. So out of the hub there. So if you can make it along, uh, then please go through the website uh, of the New South Wales ACT Baptist and book in for the annual assembly. That's next week. If you can't make it, please pray that the right decisions are made as our leaders. And we give thanks for them as they seek God's wisdom and lead us as a denomination into the future. So please be in prayer for them and be in prayer too for anyone in our church who may be unwell, but anyone that you know is unwell as well. As we come to look at God's word today, let me just open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the challenge that it gives. Lord, we rejoice in who you are. We thank you that you've called us to be your family through Jesus Christ. And Father, today as we open your word to look at Acts chapter 3, Father, prepare our hearts and minds for it. But also, Lord, we ask that when we finish looking at it today, help us to keep reflecting on it and to change our lives the way you want us to be. So Lord, we ask for that now in your name. Amen. So hopefully you've got your uh, Bibles there and we can look at Acts chapter 3. Now I want to begin today by taking you back, uh, for many of you it might be a little bit harder, but back to the early 90s. And in the early 90s there was a catchphrase, I want to be like Mike. Now, I want you to think for a moment, who's Mike? Now, what did that catchphrase come about? Well, to give you a hint, if you like basketball, that, that's a big hint. If you like the Chicago Bulls in um, the American system, that's even better. And particularly number 23. Or maybe just recently you've watched the documentary called The Last Dance. Does that give you an idea who Mike is? Of course, Mike is Michael Jordan. One of the greatest, at least at that time he was the greatest, and many since then still think the greatest basketballer that's ever played. Now, the catchphrase, I want to be like Mike, is because people wanted to play basketball, people wanted to go through life like him. He looked such a winner that everyone wanted to be like Mike. Now, how they thought they could be like Mike was simple. Buy the clothing that he used to wear. Now, wear the singlets with Chicago Bulls, number 23 on it. Buy his special range of basketball shoes and joggers and other things. And then you could be like Mike. Well, could you? Well, that's what people thought. If I buy this clothing, I can be like Mike. But it didn't happen, did it? You didn't have, you weren't like Mike because you didn't do the training. All those hours, all this, the th time in the gym, the practicing, the shooting, everything like that, all those other things that Mike did 
to be the, one of the greatest basketball players of ever. People didn't want to do that. Now that was just too hard. I want to be like Mike. But without the effort, they won't. Now I wonder if that same idea, oh, I want to be like Mike, actually creeps into our churches. Now the last few weeks, maybe it has even crept into our church. We've been looking at the book of Acts. We've been looking at the birth of the early church. And often you hear the comment, I want to be like the Acts church. I want to be like the early church. And they ask that. It sounds a little bit like, I want to be like Mike. But are you willing to put the effort in? Are you willing to put the study in to learn what that early church was like? Or do we think, I, I want to be like the early church here at Casino Baptist Church, but I just want to turn up on a Sunday and there it is. We're just like the early church. Does it work that way? Does it work that way to turn up and think someone else will do it and therefore we'll just be like the early church? Doesn't work, does it? It doesn't work that way. Like with Michael Jordan, to be like Mike takes time and effort and a whole lot of other things to even be close to a resemblance of Michael Jordan. So today, I wonder if we do the same with the church. I wonder if we say, I want to be like the early church, but we're not actually willing to put the effort in. Well, today, as we look at Acts chapter 3, as a church, as believers, Let's be willing to be challenged by God to see where we're at. So turn with me to Acts chapter 3. And as we begin, the first part I want to look at is for us to consider being open to interruptions. Now you might think, oh, well, I'm always open to interruptions. But are we? Just, just think about that for a moment. Are you someone who's willing to be open to be interrupted? Just think about that. Because when we come to look at Acts chapter 3, we find the situation, it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon. It's a normal time where the Jewish people would go to pray. And Peter and John themselves are on the way to pray. They're going to pray. And they come to this place where you've got this beautiful gate. And the gate's even called beautiful. And it was. When this, gold was co this gate was covered in silver and gold. And when you looked at the gate, it was probably worth about half what the rest of the town was altogether. That's how expensive and beautiful this gate was. But as they approach the gate, they see that there is this lame man who's been at this gate and he's begging. Now in Acts chapter 4, uh, we find that this man has actually been lame since birth. He's roughly 40 years old at the time he meets the disciples. For more than 30 years, you could probably imagine that day after day, he comes or he's brought to this beautiful gate to beg for money. And day after day, people go through looking to go through the gate to pray. And they probably, if they notice him at all, they probably think, oh, he's just a beggar. And they move on. Or for many, as they see him day after day, he's just part of the furniture. He's just part of the landscape. They probably don't even really notice him at all. He probably doesn't even get a second glance. Now they probably just go past and think, oh, I'm not going to let helping that person get in the way. I've got to go pray. You can't help someone. You've got to go pray. And I wonder if that happened day after day for this man. But I wonder if we have done that. Now I wonder if we have been uh, so uh, seen something day after day that realistically, we don't even notice it anymore. Have you ever done that? Or maybe we've been so focused on something that we don't want to let anyone interrupt us. We don't want to let anything get in the way. Uh, I know I've done this. I've gone down the street and I'm thinking, I've got to go to the bank, I've got to go to the post office, I've got to pick up some food, and then I have to do this, I have to do that. And it's almost like going through life with blinkers on, isn't it? You're just going, I'm going here, I'm going there. You've got people going past all the time. You've got interactions going on around you. The world is going on around you, but you don't really see it. You, I'm going here, I'm going there, I'm going here. And we go from one task to the another, and we don't really see what's going on around us. We don't allow ourselves to be interrupted. Have you ever done that? Now the harder question. Have you ever not helped 
someone because it was going to get in the way of you doing what you wanted to do. Now, that's a hard question to think about. Have you ever not helped someone? Have you ever seen someone who needed help and you thought, oh, I actually got to go do what I need to do because I need to get done what I need to do. It's more important that I do what I need to do. And you don't actually help the other person. Have you ever made the choice not to help someone so you're not interrupted? So I think that was happening to this poor guy begging at the beautiful gate. Day after day, people just went past. If they noticed him at all, ah, I'm not going to help you. I need to do what I want to do. Have we done that? Have we done that same type of thing? Have we not allowed ourselves to be interrupted? Now, I know I've had a very busy week this week and I've got a very busy week next week. But as I read through Acts chapter 3, I've been challenged. I've been challenged to think, did I actually miss opportunities that God has given me because I've just bounced from one thing to another? Now, it's interesting, isn't it? When we ask how someone is going, the standard answer is busy. Yeah, you know, we hold it up like a badge of honor. I'm busy. And if you're not busy, what's wrong with you? Now, we say we're busy. But should we be? Should we actually be busy? Should that be our standard answer? Because in saying that we're busy, doing one thing, doing next, great. But do we actually allow ourselves to be interrupted? When we are being busy, do we actually miss the opportunities that God gives us every day? I wonder if we do. See, I wonder today. Now, you guys have some of you, more than others, might have rushed to make sure you watch this video clip. For those of you going physically to church today or family members, they may have been running out the door because they're late and they think, I've got to get to church, got to get to church. You might have uh, done something this morning and thought, right, I've got to get back, I've got to do this, I've got to do that. Then I can watch the clip on time. You know, we premiere at 10 a.m. on a Sunday, you think, can't miss it, got to be there. But I wonder even if that, now, in going to worship, in going to connect with God's people, whether it's online or physically, I wonder even in doing that, we miss the opportunities that God gives us because we don't want to be interrupted. I wonder if we're affected that way as well. Chuck Swindoll, um, an author that many of you know, he tells a story once of... Uh, a psychiatrist who was uh, caring for a patient and the, he couldn't help the patient. The patient was becoming increasingly uh, depressed and down about everything and he couldn't help him. And the psychiatrist finally said, look, I want, want you to understand that when I'm feeling that I'm struggling with things and I'm feeling down, one of the things I love to do, it's, it's the greatest thing in the world, is I go to the circus. There's this fantastic cir circus in town and when you go there's this one clown they call him the great Rinaldi you go and talk to him you go and see him and it'll lighten your mood you look at him and you see someone who is so on top of life and then the poor man who was the patient said to the psychiatrist I can't do it and the psychiatrist said why and the patient said, I am the great Rinaldi. Yeah, sometimes people can look like they've got it all together. Some people can look like they're on top of the world. Everything's going right for them. Like, but it's not. They're hurting. They're in pain. They're struggling for whatever reason it might be. And they need help. Do we take the time to allow ourselves to be interrupted, to see the needs of the people around us and then take the time to reach out to them. Now, the Jewish people going through the beautiful gate day after day to pray, past this lame man, this beggar. They probably labelled him beggar and then moved on. Didn't help him at all. Didn't take the time to be interrupted. 
I wonder if we put labels like that on people. You know, you know, last week or last couple of weeks, I've been telling you, I don't like putting labels, religious labels on people. But I wonder if we do it in our world. You know, we see people and we might call them beggars down the street. We might label them as homeless or dirty, mentally unstable. We might label people as indigenous or foreigners or old or young men or women and we just walk on by we don't allow ourselves to take the time to be interrupted what about in this place now what about when you go to church physically and if you haven't been for a while i encourage you uh, if you have an opportunity go to church physically great that you can watch these clips uh, on youtube but if you can get a chance go physically to church but i wonder if we do it there too. Now I wonder if we label people as fundamental or liberal, Bible basher, charismatic, Pentecostal, end timer, a member, non-member, and we just walk on by. I wonder if we do it in outside the church. I wonder if we do it inside the church where we don't allow ourselves the time to be interrupted. Because even in church there are people that are hurting. Even in church, now there are people that we need to allow ourselves to be interrupted so that we can help them. Last week in Acts chapter 2, when we looked at verse 42 to 47, we talked about that beautiful word fellowship. And we said, yeah, we want to have that type of fellowship. The fellowship that is that I know people so well that we are described as sharing the same blood system, that we care for each other, that we love each other so much that if you have a need, I see it, I know it, and I do my best to meet it. That allows me, in a sense here, when we get to Acts chapter 3, saying, do we allow ourselves to be interrupted? It's the same thing. It's allowing us to have that fellowship. How good are we at doing it outside the church? Are you willing to be interrupted? What about inside the church? You know, we talked uh, with that Acts chapter 2. They were fighting against their society. They were facing persecution. Uh, their society, not much different to ours, very focused on being the individual. The world revolves around us as individuals. And that was about it. Now, that selfish picture, when you think of the fellowship in Acts 2, that goes against that. That's anti-individualism. It's anti-being uh, selfish. It's about community. It's about family. And when we think of taking the time to be interrupted and allowing ourselves to be interrupted, it says, it's not about me. It says it's not about my needs. It's not about what I'm doing. It's not about me going A, B, C and getting all my tasks done in the day. It's about me taking away the blinkers and saying other people, their needs are more important than mine. I'm going to allow myself to be interrupted so I can meet their needs. Now, I know for many of you uh, with our church, uh, we have started this church partnership with Compassion. And for some of you struggling financially, you've actually allowed yourselves beautifully to be interrupted so that even though you may not be, that even though that you are struggling, you still help someone else. You still help a child and a local church in another country. Okay, that's allowing yourself to be interrupted. That is something we need to do outside the church. It's something we need to do in the community. It's something we need to do inside the church. So today, how good are we at allowing ourselves to be interrupted? Peter and John did it very well when they talked to this man. Now, it's interesting. The man asked them now, for money. Now, when Peter and John stopped, they offered to help. Now, helping should never be the end and all that we do. It definitely can be a part of it. Physically helping people is a great thing that we can do, but it's never the end goal. We need to do something more because helping people is good. What we actually need to do is give them the best. And we can see that when we come to Peter and John. The beggar asked for money. Peter and John shared Jesus with him. They shared the power and the love of Jesus. He wanted something good. He needed money to eat. Now, they could have given him some and may have given him some. But they gave him the best. They talked to him 
about Jesus. And when we see this picture here in Acts chapter 3, now I think it's a real picture of our human race. When you take what this man represented, our human race, we are lame, we are begging, we are spiritually lame. Now we're not going anywhere. We have a broken relationship with God. We are his enemies. We can't help ourselves just like the beggar. And what does humanity need? Humanity needs to meet Jesus. This beggar needed to meet Jesus. Peter and John shared Jesus with him. And our humanity today needs to meet Jesus as well. I wonder how often do we take the opportunity, not just to help people, but to go the step of not just doing good, but doing the best and actually sharing Jesus with them. Some people do need physical help. Yes, we should do that. But as a church, we don't want to be known just as a church that gives out things or helps people physically. We need to give the best. We need to be known as a church that actually shares Jesus with people. It's interesting when you look at someone like this beggar, someone who realizes that he can't help himself. He's got to rely on everything. He's rock bottom. It is when I found in is that people who are at that point, that is often the time they are most receptive to hear about Jesus. They are most in the place where they are willing to, because they know, I can't help myself. I need help from someone. And then we can share Jesus into that situation. In our world at the moment, we have the COVID crisis. We have the American political crisis. There's lots of other crises going on around the world today. What an opportunity when people are hurting. We can do physical things, good things. But what an opportunity to do the best and actually share Jesus with people. Peter and John seized the opportunity and changed this man's life forever. Will we do the same? Now, often I hear comments like, oh, we're only a small country church. We don't have many people. We don't have many finances. Maybe in the future we can do that. Maybe uh, when we have more people come in, we can do that later on. Or we can and can't do certain things in our community. Or we don't have the people to share Jesus with people. We don't have the people to help people in our community. Now you hear comments like that. Well, I think the question's the wrong question. Now we shouldn't actually be thinking about what we don't have. Let's think about what we do have. Yeah, we have Jesus. Yeah, we have the best thing, the greatest thing to give people. And even if we've just got a few people, the Spirit can use us to take Jesus to the world. The stumbling block, the blockage, is us because we don't let him. So will we let him today? Will we realize that the question we should be asking and looking at is what we do have and how we can use that for God and not focus on what we don't have. And uh, if you're a, a part of Casino Baptist Church, we've got our AGM coming up in a few weeks' time, and I think we need to reflect on this question because it's going to affect and colours our decision-making. And when we think about what we do have, we start to think more about what we can do with it, even if it's only something small for God, rather than just bemoaning what we don't have. And also, I think, when you start thinking about this question in a different way, it challenges people about whether they're going to put their hand up to say, hey, yeah, I'm going to stand up for ministry or not. I'm going to serve in this way or not. When we think about what we do have rather than what we don't, we can see how we can serve God. We can allow ourselves to be interrupted. We can give the best. I regularly hear people say to me, Stephen, we want to be like the Acts 2 church. We want to be like the local church. We want God in Acts 2.47 to say it about us, that the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. We want to be like that. Sounds like the saying, we want to be like Mike. Great. Can we actually do it? 
Well, as I said before, right back at the beginning, when people say, I want to be like Mike, they weren't because they weren't willing to put the time in. They weren't willing to put the effort in. They weren't willing to give to get. In the end, they weren't like Mike. Can we be at Casino Baptist Church? Can we be at your local church? Can you be like the local our early church? Yes, we can. We may not be identical to them, but that's why I've called this series Acts the Church Handbook because we can be closer to them than we are now. The challenge is, are you willing to be interrupted? Are you willing to put your hand up to help the community you're in and to serve God in that place? Are you willing to put the effort and the time it needs to be like that early church. And when you give, are you just going to give the good things or are you going to give the best? Now, we can help people's needs and we should be helping people's needs. But helping is not an end in itself. We need to get to the point of sharing Jesus with people. So today, will you let yourself be interrupted? This week, Will you give the best and share Jesus with someone? Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have changed our lives because of Jesus. Each day you change us through your spirit. Father, we thank you for that. Lord, we often say we're busy people, and we are. Paying bills, mortgages, doing a whole lot of different things. But Father, they can be good things. But allow us this week to be interrupted. Help us to see the needs of those around us are greater than our own. And help us to speak into those situations. And Lord, help us to be a people that don't just do the good things, but are willing to give the best and to give Jesus and to talk about Jesus to people. Father, you give us opportunities every week. Please help us to see those opportunities this week in your name. Amen. Well, again, thank you very much for joining with me today. And I look forward, uh, maybe on Wednesday, 6.30pm, to catch up with you there uh, at Facebook Live. Just go to Casino Baptist Church and you can catch up with us then. Or next Sunday, either physically at church at 10am, or if not, see you online. 10 a.m. next Sunday. God bless and I'll see you next week.